Francis, it has been quite a ride for you since you became the Facebook whistleblower in October of 2021. You came forward. Now, gosh, just what about almost two years later, mm -hmm. year and a half, now a year and a half or so later, how are you feeling? Are you happy that you came forward? Do you have any regrets? Would you do it all over again? You know, when I originally came forward, I had very, very basic goals. Like I, I, I wanted to not have to carry a secret that I thought um, had the potential to really impact the lives of others. Um, I came forward because I was concerned about how Facebook was operating in African countries and Southeast Asia. And I then and still genuinely believe that if we continue to operate the way we do, there are millions of lives on the line from things like ethnic violence. But the world has changed a lot since I came out. Um, like I'm, I was really shocked last week when the Surgeon General issued his advisory on social media and mental health for kids. Um, I've been amazed at how just knowing that these companies knew these harms were real across a wide variety of harms has really galvanized the activist community. It's caused uh, legislative conversations around the world that were, were pretty stalled for a long time. And so, you know, I'm, 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 I, if I could do it again, I would totally do it again. Um, I've been incredibly fortunate in how smooth it's gone. And um, I, I, it's uh, exceeded my wildest expectations. You've written a book about your experiences. Why did you want to take pen to paper, mm. fingers to laptop and share your story with the world? Uh, when I look with one of the things that um, kind of baffles tech journalists when I talk to them is because tech journalists live in a little bit of an echo chamber, you know, like our, our classic criticism of tech is tech lives in an echo chamber. Tech journalists also live in an echo chamber a little bit. Um, when I say to them, you know, when I, when I take flights, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a friendly person. I, I'm one of those annoying people that talks to their seatmates. I um, do that too. And yeah, <laughs> I really get to know people. Um, and uh, uh, it's amazing. At least half the people I sit next to have never heard of the Facebook whistleblower. Um, and so it's one of these things where uh, culture change, and that's the thing that we, we really need. We, we need to reset our relationship with these companies. It takes a long time. And uh, this book, I'm hoping, helps a, a much, much larger set of people, much more diverse set of people, get a seat at the table by kind of laying out, like, what are the, the conversations we need to be having? Like, what are the choices we get to make in the next few years? Um, because we are in a moment of inflection, and we need to have as many informed people at the table as possible. You know, you talk about a lot of people, Vivek Murthy, the Surgeon General, issue issuing a warning about the dangers of social media for kids, other people becoming more aware. But I watch the evolution of social media because of my profession and to see mm -hmm. how it's infiltrated the lives of my kids and how different mm -hmm. it is for, for example, my 31-year-old versus my 27-year-old in terms of the outsized role it plays in my younger daughter's life. And I'm just curious if you feel this way, but for me, I'm kind of like, what took so long? This is doesn't take a brain surgeon, a rocket scientist, or a tech expert to know that people were becoming, have, have become incredibly addicted to social media. Tristan Harris was so sounding the alarm after he left Google. All kinds of experts were saying, this is dangerous. Why did it take so long, long for this to really become headline news. One of the things I talk about in my book is, you know, what's the difference between say the car industry and like the automotive industry and, and social media when it comes to our ability to hold it accountable or, or our ability to understand it. Back in 1965, it's going to sound shocking. There were no seatbelts in cars, no airbags. Uh, I remember that. Yeah, like I, I listen to like my, my parents tell stories about like, you know, uh, the kids all like jumbling all over each other in the back of like the station wagon. And it's like, really? Wow, a different world. Um, we now put eight year olds in car seats, right? Um, the um, but when but the world changed very suddenly when a guy named Ralph Nader came out with a book called Unsafe at Any Speed. And and what really changed was that people didn't realize that there was the ability to live in a different world. 
you know, that, that we, we could, we could, we could, uh, you know, our, our fatality rate today is way less per mile driven for cars because of a long series of actions. Um, and, but the thing that people need to understand is when, when Ralph Nader published that book, you know, there were a hundred thousand automotive engineers in the world. You've been able to get a graduate degree in automotive engineering for 20 or 30 years. There have been professional organizations for 65 years. Um, when I came forward, I think they were on the order of probably 300 or 400 people in the world who really understood how systems like Facebook's work. And, and when you, and, and of those people, you know, we are educated in such narrow ways. I think a lot of those people didn't understand the larger societal consequences of those choices and decisions. And so Ralph Nader could have a chorus of automotive engineers all say, this is happening. When it comes to social media, each of us sees a different world. You know, for, for, for many, many, many people who would be the ones asking those questions, when they open social media, they see their friends and family who, who are likely relatively similar to themselves. You know, the idea that Facebook could be radically different, radically more dangerous in a place like a, an African country or in Southeast Asia, it sounds foreign to us. But like social media is about looking at pictures of cats. Um, and so I think that's that's a big part of it. Like we need um, we need to be able to have the right to study social media. We need we need to have the right to be able to get independent data off these systems because then we can have definitive conversations instead of things like Tristan. You know, he's a, a single voice that came out of a big company saying, "Hey, this is happening." We can't have that chorus of of, of researchers and independent experts all reinforcing that these things are true. Is that because we're not having a universal experience? It's a highly, mm -hmm. deeply personalized experience for everyone. So Each it's not us, as yeah. if we're all driving cars. We're all you know, on yeah. different vehicles, if you will. So it's not unifying people to realize that they have to demand mm -hmm. change. It's interesting. So like you or I, Katie, could, could buy a car and take it apart. Like neither of us has an automotive engineering degree. We we would probably struggle a little bit, but we could recruit people to help us do that. None of us can, uh, none of us other than Elon Musk can buy a social network and, and take it apart and crash test it. And 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 one of the things I, I always remind people is, and, and Katie, I know you're gonna, I know you're going to be skeptical of this. If you and I sat down together for three weeks, I could teach you enough programming that you could actually meaningfully download data from Google, like Google search results and analyze those search results. If we wanted to do the same really bare bones, basic level of accountability for social media, we'd have to recruit 20,000 volunteers to let us install little programs on their computers or on their phones so that we could watch what their own individual experiences of social media were. It's a completely different level of obfuscation of like of, of a, a curtain hiding us from what's going on. And that's part of why I wrote the book. You know, I've, I got to live a lot of that arc of how we write software or like, what does it mean to have experiences online? And I wanted to walk people through, you know, this is what changed from step to step to step. So that In more fact, people have that context. I feel like consumers don't know what they don't know. And I was on totally. the Aspen Commission for Disinformation. And one yeah. of our, our most important recommendations was to have transparency for scientists mm -hmm. and researchers and computer experts to have access to the inner workings of social media platforms like Facebook so they mm -hmm. could have the independent information they needed to make recommendations. And that is one of the huge problems is it's like what's behind the curtain? It's almost like Mark Zuckerberg is Oz although behind the curtain is much scarier than what was behind the curtain in the wizard of Oz. And, but without access to that, it's very, very hard to learn how it operates and figure mm -hmm. out what to do about it. And I'm just curious, Francis, I know you weren't super psyched to go to Facebook, but you said, if you could work it, at the civic misinformation team, you would, to your surprise, you write, they came back and they, asked you to join that team. When did you realize we're not in Kansas anymore? Something is awry. Mm -hmm. They are really mm -hmm. manipulating the public. What was your aha moment? 
Well, one one little one little uh, tweak there, Katie. It was interesting. Like when they reached out to me, it was I didn't even know that the civic the civic integrity right. team existed, and I I was kind of flippant because like I, I didn't really care if they uh, gave me a job or not. And I was like, the only thing I would work on is misinformation. And they came back like a week or two later, and like we actually have an opportunity. You know, if you're willing to be open minded. Um, you know, it was interesting. I got there, and um, I think one of the, the the first moments where I was like, "Wow, this is this is chaotic," is um, so the role I had is something called a product manager. So product managers um, are responsible for helping articulate what is the problem we're trying to solve, how might we solve that, and then once we have picked us, you know, come to consensus on a sol solution. What's the series of engineering tasks that will allow us to execute that solution? Um, I had a role as senior product manager, and Facebook understood that they were a different enough company that they had seen that if people came in from the outside, they they didn't succeed at a very high rate. Like there was a lot of churn, and so they established a boot camp for two full weeks to you know just give kind of a basic level of like here's how Facebook works. And my manager pulled me out of it with, after like three days. He was like, we're, we're, you know, things aren't fired too much. Like we have to come up with a plan for the next six months, even though you know nothing about the problem or what's going on. Like we need your articulate plan now. Um, and, and it was just, um, that was kind of my first warning that I was like, oh, wow, like the house is on fire. Like the house is on fire and people are running around um, because, you know, the, the, even having the self-awareness to be like, oh, we know that if people don't get at least a certain amount of bootstrapping, Facebook is very hard to figure out even internally how it works. Um, what was going my, on my, then? Do you, yeah. do you looking back? Oh, do you sure. remember yeah. what was going on? Oh, then? sure. Um, so they had. Um, it's interesting. So, so I think part of why my manager was so urgent was um, the there was a large established misinformation team. So when people hear misinformation, they think like Hunter Biden laptop. You know, like, you know, there was a rumor going around that I was the one that censored Hunter Biden's laptop. That team uh, was the main misinformation team. And their primary focus was on something called third party fact checking. And I go through in the book how, you know, Facebook has really uh, tooted its own horn about how impactful third party fact checking is. But the reality is it only operates in a very small handful of countries, very small handful of languages. A lot of that budget is spent on the United States, so that we think it's cleaner and safer. Um, and my manager had fought for headcount, had fought for headcount to be allowed to go and say, "There's a lot of of misinformation going on right now that is doing things like fanning ethnic violence, right, in places where we're not going to have journalists. We're, we we have no hired third party fact checkers. We have to figure out other ways to to change the product to to." Uh, influence how these systems are working. And it was interesting. I showed up for that first meeting, you know, the one that my manager was like urgently pushing me to prepare for. And and we spent 20 minutes basically discussing, should I have a job? So imagine you show up, you've just gotten hired for this thing. And all the leadership you're saying is like, why why do you have a team? Like, why does this team exist? Like, why do we? And, and, and just that, um, uh, like, think about that for a moment. You know, because activists have told you, because the UN told you, hey, in Myanmar, your negligence from misinformation killed 24,000 people. Um, you know you have a problem. And yet I could sit in a room full of, of you know, the leadership of safety, having them be like, Sh should this team exist? Right. It's just, I, I uh, you can imagine that for six months was a little stressful. <laughs> I don't get it. I don't get it. So yeah. do you think, I mean, yeah. if obviously mm -hmm. the company is not a monolith, mm. but did they care about this issue or did they just feel it was an exercise in futility? So I think this is a great example of, you know, when I talk about the idea that there's 300 or 400 people who really understand how these, these content selection and prioritization systems work, you know, I, it's important for people to understand even inside of Facebook, there's probably only 50, maybe 75 of those people, right? And I think part of the problem was that Facebook had taken the most obvious path to deal with misinformation, which was let's let's hire experts, let's hire journalists to help us assess what's true and false. But, but that kind of approach, you know, fixing safety after the fact, 
like, oh, we've already hyper amplified, you know, extreme content. Now we're going to pluck out the dangerous parts. Those strategies don't scale. You know, Facebook has 3 billion users. There were maybe a few thousand fact checks being done a month, maybe a few thousand. Um, and you can see why you actually need to take a different kind of approach, which is coming in and saying, why, why are the algorithms rewarding extreme content? You know, how do we change our operations to deal with that fact? And, and I think the, the challenge was that, you know, Facebook had already invested four years in third party fact checking. There were at least three at that point. And, um, and so having uh, my boss come in and say, hey, we need to think more holistically. We need to see, are there any other options? You can see why that could be viewed with resistance by, you know, an established institution. On the other hand, the other method just wasn't working because of the sheer yeah. volume of totally. the, the information, not to mention, as they say, lies make it around the world before the truth has the chance to tie its shoes. And my <laughs> daughter actually did some fact checking on Facebook mm. during the pandemic. She was in a program working at Reuters, which was a joint okay. Reuters Facebook program. And she would fact check. She would report stories out. But it was so frustrating for her because, mm. you know, if someone was writing that the vaccine, the COVID vaccine would give you Alzheimer's, she would correct it and check it. But to your point, it would have been distributed all over the place. And all over the place. it's sort of like how many people look at corrections in the newspaper? Not that many. Yeah. And so what was the alternative? Your your boss hmm. or whoever was was saying kind of that his, you know, whoever was saying mayday, mayday, we got a problem here, sounded like his or her, it was a guy, his heart, a guy. Yeah. his heart was in the right place and that he understood a different approach was necessary. What would that approach have been? I mean, what is the oh. answer? So I'm, um, unquestionably my boss so my boss's name is Samid. Samid unquestionably had his heart in the right place. He he uh made huge personal sacrifices over years building up the civic integrity team, which is part of why when it was dissolved, that was like a trigger for me to come forward. Um and uh, the uh to give you a sense of like what are our alternatives, let's take for example something as simple as should you have to click on a link before you reshare it. So you, you hit the nail on the head. One of the problems with third-party fact-checking is journalism takes time. You know, uh, at Facebook, it was it, on average, it was like two or three days for someone to write a fact-check. And they put a huge amount of effort into trying to build prediction systems to guess which are the pieces of content that might go viral because um, the uh, they had to guess like preemptively, like this, this may go viral, so we have to give the journalists a head start. Um, alternatives are things like if you require people to click on a link before they reshare it, um, that reduces misinformation by like 10 or 15% just because people have to pause and think for a moment. Um, NPR what, did a what really, would, oh, sorry. What would, sorry. what would that link lead to? Oh, just no, like, like just literally, and like you see a link on Facebook, you know, and before you click that reshare button, you should have to click on the article you're about to share, right? Sounds really basic. But I'll give you an example. NPR did a really fun um, practical, like a April Fool's joke when I was at Facebook, which was they had a headline that said, people don't read anymore. And if you clicked through on the article, it said, hey, if you get, the, if you see this in your social media feed, please don't share it, right? This the article is about how people don't, you know, even take a moment to pause and reflect on what they're sharing before they share it. And so like, you can ask, well, why was it that Twitter was willing to say, hey, like we're gonna put a warning up where if you try to share something before you read it, we're gonna give you a moment, just a, a little a little speed bump to say, hey, why don't, why don't you think from like have a moment of reflection? I think part of why Twitter chose to do that and Facebook didn't was the average user around the world, this is sound counterintuitive, the average user of Facebook around the world is much less literate than the average Twitter user or it was when I was there. Because, you know, there's one or two billion people on Facebook who, you know, uh, live in places where Facebook is the internet. You know, they might have become literate to use Facebook. Um, and when, and as a result, those places, in some countries, 35% of everything you see on your newsfeed is a reshare. 
And so Facebook wasn't willing to take the hit of, you know, 0.1, 0.2% less profit of reducing the amount of content that was moving through the ecosystem as a whole. So those are kinds of product design ways of dealing with misinformation. You, 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 you give people chances to reflect, you reduce the speed of virality, you know, you, you, um, I, you give people chances to give feedback, you know, there's, there's ways of doing these things. Are third party fact checkers still the primary way Facebook uh, is ostensibly trying to combat mis and disinformation? You know, I don't know, like, because we have no transparency. So I, I, I think your conclusion from the Aspen, Aspen Council is spot on. You know, right now, we don't have any transparency into how the Facebook operates. We know that Mark fired lots and lots of safety people during his year of efficiency. Um, so it's, it's possible that things have changed, but given his recent behavior, it's, it's unlikely things have materially changed. Let's talk about the transparency. I'm curious, you talked about how Facebook is different than Twitter, also the average consumer of Facebook versus Twitter. What about other platforms like Google, mm -hmm. for example, or Pinterest? Do they have more transparency than Facebook? Great question. So um, I would say Pinterest has a similar, is a similarly opaque to either Twitter or um, Facebook. It used to be Twitter was more transparent because they had a, a data feed that researchers could get um, that allowed them to see what was happening on Twitter. And uh, they have basically cut off that avenue for research because they now charge $42,000 a month to get access to it. Like, yes. uh, they, 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 I know, I know, it's amazing. Um, but um, but Google, I want to be clear, like, um, so let's distinguish, say, YouTube from Google.com. So Google.com, we all basically see the same search results. And as a result, you know, there are lots and lots of people out there who download the search results and write papers on them, you know, do bias analysis on them. YouTube is similar to either Facebook or Pinterest because they have a, a recommendation algorithm that is picking out those videos you see. And we have a, we, we have no idea how that behave, how that performs, um, what's the inner internal logic, and they 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 choose not to give us the same kind of you know research access that um, that we need in order to ask those questions. Let's talk about sort of the public facing explanation from Facebook. I interviewed Cheryl Sandberg in 2019 mm -hmm. when you were still working at Facebook. I asked her if mm -hmm. she felt like Facebook was doing enough to invest in its security. Um, let's take a listen and let's hear your reaction to what Cheryl told me. We don't want Facebook to be broken up because we think we're able to provide great services across the board. We think we're able to invest in security across the board. So Do you invest enough in security across the board? Uh, we invest a lot. We're investing much, much, much more. It's part of the announcements we made yesterday. We have we have hired an extra 35,000 people. We've put tremendous engineering resources and we're doing things like red teams, asking what do we think the bad guys would do and how would we do it? So we're never going to fully be ahead of everything. But if you look at, if you want to understand what companies care about, you look at where they invest their resources. And if you look back three to five years and you look at today, we've totally changed where we invest our resources. And my job has changed too. If I look at, I've been at Facebook 11 and a half years. For the first eight or so, I spent most of my time growing the company and some time protecting the community. We always did some protection, but now that's definitely flipped. My job is majority building the systems that protect and minority grow. And so we're definitely changing as a company. We're in a different place across the board on all of these things. Do you think you're changing enough, fast enough? I hope so. And we're trying. We're definitely trying. I mean, I think it's about not just the current threats, but the next threat. The question we ask ourselves every day is, okay, we know what happened in 2016, and now we're gonna work to prevent it. What is the next thing someone is gonna do? And that's gonna take a lot of thought and a lot of cooperation across the board. What's your reaction to that, Francis? Uh, it's it's so interesting, like, you know, we when, when we listen to media, you know, a, a film clip, an audio clip from the past, you know, you can often hear like um, like the emotional echoes of that moment. And I think back in 2019, 2019 she was she was quite earnest. Like the, the only part of Facebook that was really like Facebook blue, just like Facebook.com. The only part of Facebook.com that was growing was the civic integrity team. You know, Facebook 
Facebook had, you know, um, I think 2019 was the year that the UN report on Myanmar came out and, you know, firmly placed blame on Facebook. Um, they were still living right in the immediate echoes of Cambridge Analytica. Her context, right about when she, when you interviewed her, that would have been when the FTC fined Facebook $5 billion because of privacy violations from Cambridge Analytica. But over the course of the next two years, or even the next year, um, I think Facebook um, began to realize that having a big safety team, having having people with PhDs asking questions, was was putting Facebook in a quite awkward position because the more people dug in, the more people started ask having the ability to ask questions. They found things, and they they found things that were quite disturbing. You know, it might be that you know. Um, counterterrorism content, you know, content where people are trying to de-radicalize each other, you know, 75% of counterterrorism content in Arabic was getting taken down because the systems were so crude that they couldn't confuse terrorism promoting content and counterterrorism content. Or, you know, human traffickers were openly operating on the system or, or cartels were recruiting members and intimidating local populations. You know, every time a report like that gets written, it becomes a liability. And, you know, in the wake of, you know, like she said, you know, in 2016, we learned about this threat, you know, we have to look at the next threat. I think they did a pretty good job in the run up to the 2020 election. But as soon as the 2020 election passed, they fired that team, the civic integrity team. My one team. month after the um, election. Yeah. One month, less than one month, less than a month. And of and, course, and, five weeks later yeah, was when the yeah. Trump supporters, uh, many of whom organized yeah. on Facebook, stormed the U.S. Capitol. And I think part of what happened was, um, you know, there there are there are papers in the Facebook files that say, like, we, we saw this building up. But I think because now no single person was responsible, um, no one felt like they had the authority to call the war room to go in there and, and intervene, right? At and the so same this- time, Francis, at the same time, mm-hmm. I wonder... You know, nobody knew that these people Hmm. were going to storm the Capitol. I think they were organizing to protest what they thought was an illegitimate election. You know, I think they were egged on by the president of the United States and his Mm -hmm. cohorts. And so in fairness, it's hard to say, oh, these people are going to storm the Capitol. These people are insurrectionists just from their organization, just from their organizing on Facebook, right? I mean, I can understand mm-hmm. where where do you draw the line and nobody can has a crystal ball to say these people totally. are going to do that. So I think, you know, there's, so this is one of the things where it may not, may not be obvious from the outside versus the inside. You know, Facebook had data on these groups. On They could see that a, a movement was very, very, very rapidly building. It was being pushed by a very small number of people. We're talking hundreds or thousands of people were uh, were actively, actively recruiting hundreds of thousands or millions of people um, because of, of vulnerabilities in Facebook software. Like if I inter- inter- if I invited you to a group, Facebook could just put you in that group for 30 days. Um, and if you engaged with any of the content, you, know, you put an angry face, you say, this is misinformation, it'd make you a member for that group. Um, you know, Facebook could see that was happening and they could see these groups had substantially more hate speech and more of what's known Mm -hmm. as violence inciting language. You know, people calling for violence, people um, talking about violence. You could see it very cleanly in the data. And so I think it's one of these things where, where, um, you know, Facebook talks about the difference between movements and what are known as adversarial movements. So an adversarial movement knows that they're violating Facebook's policies and actively does countermeasures to try to get around Facebook. That could be, that. that's one way you can uh, di- differentiate between like, does this movement think they're doing something wrong, right? Um, right. And you saw that extensively with South the Seal. If the Facebook and civic integrity team had not been disbanded uh, less than one month after the election, what would they have seen and what would they have mm-hmm. done with the activity they witnessed going on on the platform? Sure. So in the run up to the 2020 election, there were a number of, of um, things in place 
that were, you know, they, you know, Cheryl talked about how they had red teams. These are people who play war games and say, no, you could do this. You could do that. You know, what if we did this? Um, and then and you identify countermeasures to address those issues. In the run to the 2020 election, there were a number of things in place where Facebook said, hey, we know we have vulnerabilities in our system. For example, um, live video. So this is where, you know, I can hold up, you know, I can film something on my phone. And Facebook will, will put a little war, uh, announcement at the top of people's feeds. Facebook knew that live video was a particularly um, particularly big vulnerability for the company because um, uh, video is harder to monitor than audio or, or, or text for sure. And live um, video, certainly with some active exactly. shooters. And oh, some... yeah, exactly. So, so for example, um, in the case of Christchurch, which was a shooting in a mosque in New Zealand, you know, the the person who did the shooting live casted on on Facebook live um, and Facebook didn't take it down until the police contacted Facebook and informed them that it was going up. I mean, like it shows you where the vulnerabilities are. And so where are those 35,000 people ostensibly checking? I mean, yeah. that was prior to yeah. that, but where are the yeah. thousands of people yeah. responsible for that content? I think it shows that that's just doesn't work. <laughs> Exactly. So, so you either can deal with it after the fact, or you can say, hey, what's leading to say that viral, that video going viral? And in the case of live video, Facebook said, hey, you know, every piece of content on Facebook earns a score, you know, based on how relevant is it to you, Katie, or to your listener? You know, is it similar to other things that they've seen before? Does this person generally produce content that people would like to engage with? You know, there's a bunch of factors. You earn a score. And that gives you a priority in the news feed. When it came to live video, they would give a boost. They'd say, that score, we're going to multiply it by 850 times to make it sure that it will show up at the top of your feed. They said, hey, we know this is dangerous. We're going to only boost it 65 times in the run to the election. It's a little tiny detail. But when they stormed the Capitol, they, the, 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 the rioters actively used live video to coordinate. You know, they could go and do a live video and it popped up to the top of the feed for everyone in that crowd. And so there's these little things where they could have had the safety measures on that were on on election day, but because no one felt they had the authority to say, we're in a situation, no one turned those on until the day after the election or after, me, after inauguration, the day after they stormed the Capitol. Could they have notified the authorities that they were seeing the building of this group speaking, you know, using hmm. hate speech and talking about violence, could they have said, could they have notified, you know, the Capitol Police? Could they have notified the White House? Who knows if the White House would have done anything, but could they have, within their policies, reached out to some kind of authority to say, this is mm -hmm. brewing and we want you to be aware of it? Or would that be a violation of Facebook policies? Hmm. So I I um I don't I, I don't I I don't think they needed to notify the government like the there were a number of things the government did in advance uh, of of uh, the day that uh, January sixth uh, to prepare. Um, I think the issue is well, not really. That, you know, I mean, they they were they didn't have enough police officers there. I mean, oh, they yeah, yeah. really that's different. That's that's a deployment issue. So there's a question of did the government know and did the government act? And those mm -hmm. are two slightly different things. But in the case of of like the movement growing as a whole. You know, there's there's things like um, Facebook has a policy against inauthentic behavior, right? That if you're hiding your location, if you're hiding your identity, if you're pretending to be someone else, you're not supposed to operate on the platform. And what Facebook should have done very early on is they saw that for the, the so Stop the Steal was not a single group on Facebook. It was lots and lots of different uh, group page, uh, group uh, Facebook groups, it was pages. They saw that there were a very small number of people who were all co-moderators of those groups and a huge fraction, like on the order of 35% or 40% would hide their location, right? There were these red flags that these were not people who were, who were behaving in accordance with, with um, you know, people who are genuinely using the platform. And so I think it's more a question of Facebook should have followed its own rules. They should have actually had people on staff. And instead, you know, people were burnt out after getting their teams dissolved and they went on vacation for three weeks. And so again, what, what should they have done? What could they have done? So I'll give you another example. Um, so part of the challenge with these systems, um, and this is another example of like 
design questions. When you have a post that causes a lot of comments, maybe there's a fight in the comment threads, every new comment makes that a new post in your newsfeed. You know, it can go back up to the top of your newsfeed. One of the things that was on on election day was that if you were doing lots of calls for violence, uh, they turned on self-moderation of groups. It sounds like a, a really, you know, like Francis, aren't they just going to approve their own posts? It turns out that when you say, hey, you can say whatever you want, but you have to staff moderators to approve those posts, a smaller volume of posts go out, right? Or for example, if there were too many calls for violence, they would do things like turn off the comment threads so that those posts couldn't go up to the top of the feed over and over and over again. These are little tiny details but you have to remember when we people interviewed the the rioters after January 6, they they acted. They said it seemed real. It seemed real. It seemed like everyone was saying, like you know, we're we're about to experience a coup. Like we need to like go and save our democracy. These little product tweaks would have changed the information environment that those people experienced, and and who knows what would have happened with January 6. So why didn't they do it? Because the team had been dissolved. I think I think the issue was like in the run up to the 2020 election, there was a structured what's known as a, a Facebook loves its acronyms it's called an integrated product operation center, an IPOC, which is which is a war room, right? You know, a group of specialists from across the company came together and said, "Hey, let's coordinate resources to make sure that we're on the ball." There was no longer a person in the company who had you know wore the hat of saying, "Let's make sure we're a positive force in society." Right. There was diffuse responsibility for little tiny slivers. And I think after they dissolved the team, which was was on um, it was like December 2nd or December 3rd, um, I don't I don't think there was anyone who felt like they had the authority to say, hey, some people are going to have to work over the holidays. Right. Like this is a big enough deal that someone's going to have to do something. Um, and I think that's why Facebook was asleep at the wheel. Do you think Mark Zuckerberg just cares about profit over everything? And is there something about the broader culture mm -hmm. of Facebook that makes this almost a Sisyphean task to try to control or at least even monitor or remove really dangerous content? So I'm, I'm glad that you bring up Mark. Um, so just so people understand how different the leadership of Facebook is versus other companies, um, Mark Zuckerberg holds about 55, 56% of the votes, the shares or the voting shares that control Facebook. So that means he's the chairman of the board, he's the CEO. Uh, if he wants to invest tens of billions of dollars in the metaverse, no one can stop him because he's the only voice that matters. Um, I do think responsibility goes to the top, right? Like part of the challenge here is you have a man who has been CEO since he was 19 years old. You know, Facebook, is in, you know intimately tied to his identity. And it's very hard for people to admit that their life's work might be hurting other people. And so unfortunately, there is an internal culture to the company where the people who surround Mark know that you know being too critical isn't going to get you very far. Like in I fact, think I, part of what- Go ahead. I said, I think part of why Cheryl left um, uh, after you know, the chaos of 2021 or like, um, you know, from when I came out um, to, you know, she, came out, she left maybe six months after the Facebook files happened. I think that's because Cheryl was a voice that was trying to push for responsibility and there, there wasn't really an appetite in terms of the company to do that. To this point, I spoke with her about whether Facebook's business model ultimately rendered implementing security measures bad for business. Let's hear what she said. There's so many huge challenges and how difficult is it, Cheryl, truly to address any of these when solving them in some ways work works against your business model? You know, one critic said Facebook has priced itself out of morality. And wow. I'm curious if this is just, I mean, implementing some of these changes is bad for business. So on this, I'm really pretty proud of our track record. If you look um, a number of years ago and you listen to our earnings calls. So earnings calls are exactly what people are worried about. They're directed at investors. It's our quarterly report. If you actually watch us in earning calls, we are spending as much time talking about the measures we take on safety and security as we are about our business growth easily. 
We actually said many quarters ago, this is so important to us that we are going to make massive investments and change the profitability of our company by making real resource investments. And we have to the tune of billions and billions of dollars, and we will keep doing it. We've taken action after action after action that is better for protecting the community than it is for our growth. And we're going to continue to do that. Mark has said it over and over again. I have said it over and over again. Do you believe that, Francis? You know, Katie, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad you played that clip for me because I am totally going to go get the transcripts now of the investor calls just to see how things have changed, right? Because I think back in 2019, they were trying, like they, they got burned by Cambridge Analytica, right? You know, they, they lost a huge amount of goodwill uh, from regulators, from, from users. I don't think that's, I don't think that sentiment she expressed is still true. You know, um, one of the things that Elon Musk showed was that you could fire all your safety teams and no one batted an eye, right? Because we don't have any stats, the only things, so a big part about why I wrote this book was to talk about what's the system of incentives that leads to this kind of behavior. Right now, the only data that we get out of these companies is, you know, how many users do they have? How much time do you spend? How many ads do you click on? What's that revenue? Um, you don't get the, 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 the societal costs that come as, as a consequence. And, um, I want to be I want to be super honest with people. Mark Zuckerberg has fired a huge number of safety people in the last six months, and the market has rewarded him. You know, their stock price is going up because Facebook looks more profitable. But he also fired their AI safety team, and then they open sourced their large language model. When people talk about existential risks from AI, allowing for mass proliferation of these technologies doesn't allow us to do thoughtful, slow, intentional development. Um, and so I don't think what she's saying is, is true anymore. It's, it's, it, we do you think it was true at the time, though? Way. In fairness to Cheryl, I, do you think it was true at the time? I think that in 2019, they were trying hard. You know, like I said, um, part of why if, if, if Facebook had continued in the vein they were working in in 2019, I probably would have never been a whistleblower. You know, I probably would have been like many people who came before me who like kept their head down and kept trying, kept trying to make it safer and eventually burned out. Um, because the only part of Facebook that was growing was the safety teams in 2019. But it, by 2020, by 2020, they had given up on that. You know, they'd said, this is not, we're not getting acknowledged for the effort we're putting in. And, you know, these teams are just liabilities. Do you think Cheryl left because she just couldn't do it anymore? That it was such mm. an uphill battle and that she was concerned about the direction mm -hmm. of Facebook and how it would impact her own personal brand, if you will? You know, it's interesting. Um, I, I I am not a mind reader, so I cannot attribute things to Cheryl's intentions. But she left. I Just so your listeners are, they probably don't follow Facebook gossip the way I do. Um, uh, but I think it's fascinating to see the circumstances, how she left. So when she left, she left very suddenly. Usually when executives that are that, you know, August in a company leave, there's companies make a big deal about the contribution that those people did. When she left, Facebook said that uh, she was she she was being kind of uh, pushed out because she had used um, company resources for planning her wedding and for promoting her book. And and for context for people, this isn't Lean In. This is the book she wrote after Lean In, which was about resiliency. You know, so her and about husband when died. her husband Day died yeah. and I interviewed her for that yeah. book. And, and, and what's fascinating that they pointed at that, you know, that she, they, she used company resources to promote that book when that book was about how Facebook groups let her get through the grief of her, of her husband dying. Like it was an ad for the power of Facebook in like a warm and fuzzy way. And so I think something, something was going on with her exit. You know, um, there's a lot of investigations going on right now. And I don't, I, you know, I have no insight when I'm sight into any of them, but the, the reality is I think Cheryl's name was probably on, was probably the last name on a lot of documents. You know, uh, she, like she said, she worked on a lot of safety systems and I, I'm, I, I'm, this is just uh, uh, my like reading tea leaves here, but I'd be unsurprised if she was asked to, you know, uh, contribute to those investigations because I don't know why they would have pushed her out in such a, a sudden and rough way otherwise. Let me ask you just, uh, you know, what can be done? We've heard about kids and mental health. We've heard about 
misinformation and the election. Mm. We've heard about so many things that are causing harms to society because of social media platforms like Facebook. Section 230 prevents or protects these social media platforms from liability for the content they may carry. Mm -hmm. uh, the Supreme Court just made a ruling on that, and I guess now it's up to Congress. But in the best of all possible worlds, what would you like, Francis, to be done to rein mm -hmm. in these social media companies if you had to wave a magic wand? So I think it's important for people to understand kind of what's the tool chest that's available to us. You know, in, intuitively, we're like, oh, like we should make companies liable for the content that they host. Um, the only problem with these solutions, with solutions like that, um, and, and, you know, that's kind of the China solution as you know, there's, here's the forbidden ideas approach, um, is that right now we don't really have technologies that allow us in an effective, scalable, precise way to find all the bad things. Like we're always going to end up in a situation where we take down a lot of good content in the process of taking down that bad content. And when we make companies liable for $50,000 for you know, a piece of bad content, they'll over-censor speech if we take that approach. I think the way forward is more something like what Europe did. So Europe came in and said, hey, you need to be honest with us about the risks, the harms you know about. You need to publicly tell us how you're going to reduce those risks. And you need to give us enough data that we can see if you're making progress on those things. Um, because for, for context, you know, right now, um, the relationship, the, I think the fundamental problem is our relationship with these companies is skewed. Like uh, you mentioned uh, academics getting access to data to understand how these systems work. We are in such a fraught place right now that Facebook has sued academics that caught them in lies. You know, they sued researchers at NYU because they showed that the political ads database was ineffective. Um, we need, if unless we can even out that playing field a little bit, Facebook will continue to cut corners. They'll continue to have worse and worse problems. And and a lot and the solutions that exist, and, and we can uh, there's some really low hanging fruit for kids, for example. The solutions that exist are not going to get used if Facebook continues to be the only one who can grade their homework. And Congress doesn't seem to really understand the rudimentaries of the technology that powers Facebook to actually want to do something about it. I know there's been legislation introduced, but it just doesn't seem to be getting any traction. I think one of the, so, you know, people often ask me, why was Europe able to pass the Digital Services Act? And, and we can't even pass laws giving safe harbor to researchers, right? There's a law right now in front of Congress saying, Maybe academics should be allowed to ask questions about Facebook and not get sued. Um, why is it we can't we can't seem to get our get 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 moving? And I think part of that is that people in the United States use the cleanest, safest version of Facebook in the world. You know, in the case of um, misinformation, eighty-seven percent of the operational budget for misinformation in in twenty twenty one went to English, even though only you know eight or nine percent of users speak English. The Europeans were paying a higher cost because their languages were being ignored, and so they were willing to act. I think the thing that's going to push uh, Congress over the line is actually the growing um, crisis around teenage mental health. Historically, just for, for people's context, um, over the last 60 years, we've had only a handful of Surgeon General advisories. It's things like seatbelts save lives, smoking causes cancer, breastfeeding helps infants' health. You know, things that we take for granted today. But before those advisories happened, there, there was ambiguity. There, there was controversy. Historically, after a Surgeon General advisory is issued, usually within two to three years, some kind of legislation, some sort of legislative action takes place. And so I think it'll be really interesting to see how things play out over the next year or two, at least in the context of kids. And what can be done about that? Are there age limits? Yeah. Um, I know that they have the tools that can enforce mm -hmm. some of these things, Francis. You mm -hmm. write about that. They just don't use them. So mm -hmm. tell me how mm -hmm. to reverse or stop the negative impact 
that social media and things like Instagram are having on young people. So you mentioned earlier um, that you know the, the business model is is working counter to our own well being or, or safety. Um, let's take a look at at sleep deprivation in kids. So uh, one of the things called out by the Surgeon General last week was that thirty percent, thirty percent of teenagers say they use social media till midnight or later most weekdays. That's crazy. Sorry, uh, that that's amazing. Um, when we look at risk factors for things like multiple kinds of mental illness, that's not just depression and anxiety, it's also things like bipolar. Um, when we look at risk factors for accidental death, both, both automotive and just general accidents, when we look at risk factors for substance use, uppers because they're, they're, they're tired, downers because they're depressed, all of those things link back to sleep deprivation. We've known for 20 years that we can influence whether or not people use products. You know, imagine a world where, a, a uh, you know, after staying up till 2 a.m., you know, a kid is sitting kind of, you know, hungover in math class. They were on Instagram too late. And a little alert popped up and said, hey, when do you want to go to bed tonight? And for two hours, they say, you know, I want to go to bed at 11. My mom wants me to go to bed at 10. But I want to go to bed at 11. Imagine if for two hours before 11, Instagram got a little bit slower and a little bit slower and a little bit slower. It was like, it was like you're pushing the posts a little harder. Maybe there was a lag on Insta on uh, TikTok or same videos. Who knows? We've known for 20 years that if you make an app a little bit slower, people use it less. Imagine as you approach your bedtime, you just got tired and went to bed. That feature is live on Instagram today. If you're stealing content from Instagram. You know, if you're if you're a if you're downloading posts because you're making a database or whatever your reason, they don't take your account down. They slow your account down because if they take your account down, you'll just get a new account. Uh, and that's a meaningful thing that would help kids go to bed. Or or imagine parents you, come in and take their kids' phones. We should definitely do that, right? <laughs> I like mean, phones phones should charge in the bedroom. But but we we need to be honest here, which is that we need systematic solutions. Like when we when we put these things on individual kids and individual families, we ignore the fact that these technologies are extremely powerful, and they and operate at the level of and addictive, and they operate at the level of independence that you know no other consumer product does today. In closing, Francis, I feel like I have to ask you about AI, which is the mm, new. Okay boogeyman of mm -hmm. uh, technology, and rightfully so. It was pretty chilling when these AI leaders said that artificial intelligence poses a threat as big as pandemics and, and nuclear war. And hmm. it's sort of like, holy shit. Uh, uh, and, and yet you wonder, since the government has been so impotent when it comes to figuring out how to regulate social media, what they're going to do about this looming threat. Mm. Are you as afraid as, as mm. I am about this new, incredibly fast mm. developing technology? Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important to differentiate short-term risks of these large language models. That's things like chat GPT. Um, versus longer term existential risk issues. And longer term in this context is, you know, probably at least 20 years, if not 50 years. So the, the short term risks are things like, you know, our information environments getting polluted by bots. You know, one of the major ways we catch information operations, influence operations today on, on our platforms is repetition. You know, they, they say the same things over and over again. You can see coordinated action, they look similar. Once you have generative AI, you know, going in there and making them all look like different people, it gets a lot harder to catch um, information operations. We have to design social networks in slightly different ways. We have to monitor them in different ways um, once that happens. That's a reason for us to act sooner on trying to get social media under control. Or, for example, labor displacement. I think there's a really good chance that a lot of uh, white class, um, white, white class, white collar um, workers are going to lose their jobs, or or entry level workers will lose, will, will have trouble getting their first jobs, right? Because those more basic tasks are going to get automated. Um, I, I think those are things where because. Um, uh, white collar workers are the ones being displaced. We will likely have meaningful conversations on on where to go next. The bigger question, 
So like you brought up, you know, this is a, a threat on par with pandemics, nuclear war. Like human extinction. <laughs> They're talking like human about extinction. human dis- yeah. extinction. Yeah. So I think it's always important to remember that these are percentage risks, right? So this is, you know, they say there's a 1%, a 2% risk, which is terrifying, right? If, you know, one or 2% risk of extinction, we should take those seriously. But I think one of the things that people also need to be honest about is, is um, you know, we kind of let the cat out of the bag, right? You know, when Facebook open sourced their model, they made it, you know, they gave a $100 million leg up to every small person who wants to play in this space, right? We had a chance when it was just like Google and Microsoft and OpenAI and a handful of companies that were in the space, we had a chance to do deliberate development and and we have now seen nuclear proliferation. And so, um, you know, I've seen people talk about, you know, what would it actually take to, to take that existential risk down to, to zero? And it's things like calling in drone strikes on data centers right? Like a, a core difference between nuclear proliferation and an AI proliferation is, um, I, you know, we can put satellites up in space and detect when people cheat on nuclear development treaties because radiation exudes particles. We are not going to be able to say with high confidence that this data center is meaningfully more risky than that data center. And so, um, uh, I hate to be a downer, Katie, I am, I am a very positive person, right? Like, we can do a pep talk on why I think we can we can solve social media. Um, uh, I don't I don't want to live in a world where we call in drone strikes on data centers, right? Like I think that is a level of power that is 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 um, too likely to be abused and misused. Um, and so, if if truly we have let the, you know we we've, we've summoned the genie, um, you know I I don't I don't know if that is actually a, a thing that we can stop that train. And so uh, I always say, read the book on the beach. You know, we can live wonderful, meaningful lives, even with existential risk hanging over our heads. Um, and that uh, we should try to maximize the good um, and minimize the bad. I know so you're saying, that I, you're saying, Francis, the guardrails, yeah. these, these developers are pleading the government yeah. to implement uh, may not so, work. So- so, 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 Katie, for context, I think there's a huge need. Like, I, one of the things I'm, I'm uh, is on my like list. I have a long, unfortunately, I have a lot of things on my list of, you know, I should write a white paper on this. I think things like Fortune 500 companies should get together and say, "Hey, we will only buy generative AI products that meet this bar of safety." You know, there's a code of practice, a code of conduct, where we're like, we're not going to let our economic might fuel development of AI unless you do it in an intentional, thoughtful. Uh, responsible. Way that has responsible way. I think I think that's totally a thing that should happen. A hundred percent. I think Sam Altman's talks about having licenses and saying, "Hey, right now there's a market disincentive to be safe. You know, move fast and break things." To quote Mark Zuckerberg, you know, the fact that Facebook fired their AI safety team, no one's punishing them for that. Those are all good things. But when people talk about existential risk. You know, to not have that existential risk, we have to say no one in the world, that includes governments and militaries, get to have AIs more powerful than a certain level. Um, and in order to pr- make sure that people aren't cheating, and, and I, we need to look back at the history of things like nuclear treaties. Historically, we only banned even tests of nuclear things if they were detectable. So we banned um, airborne tests, water tests, above ground tests, we banned those first. We had a whole nother treaty to do underground test bans because we didn't have a way for a number of years to detect if someone um, did a nuclear test underground or was it an earthquake? It's almost it's almost as it's almost as if we it's almost as if we need a, a mutually assured destruction treaty for artificial intelligence. Well, I actually, that's, that's where it gets scary. So, so Katie, I like, I, I hope we don't end on too much of a downer because I, I always okay, that's be careful okay. not to scare people, but um, I, I, I don't know. If, I don't know if that's true. Right. So like part of why people talk about the risk of AI is, you know, um, you know, in a mutually assured destruction world, we escalate. Right. So if, if I think there might be a risk that my adversary is going to automate part of their military because it allows them to act faster 
you know, I have an, in a mutually assured destruction world, I have an incentive to do the same. I'm like, oh, I'm going to automate my military. And now we put ourselves on this like hair trigger risk thing of like, we might have a whole war that plays out over the course of hours because it, no humans have to coordinate. It's just the AI, AI is doing it. And so in many ways, like, um, I think we need to focus actually on the opposite side where we say, what are the things we can do to decrease the risk of conflict? You know, how do we have a just more stable world? Because um, if we are just escalating, the path of escalation will lead to will lead to all those existential risks. Is there anything you're excited about when it comes to AI, Francis? So we don't have oh, to totally. end on and, a terrifying note. Yeah, and and that's part of that's part of what I um I I that's why you know I was talking about before. We need to talk about short term and long term, right? The short term on generative AI, I think, is transformative. You know, right now around the world, there are literally billions of people who don't have doctors. Um, we're going to live in a world in the next 10 years where every child in the world has a pediatrician. It just might be an auto, you know, a robot pediatrician. In the next 10 years, we're going to live in a world where every child in the world is going to have the highest quality reading instruction that has ever existed for humanity. You know, an endlessly patient tutor that will sit there and over and over again, as long as that kid keeps working, will help them learn to read that's going to be transformative at the same time like that. And so this is one of these things I think we're going to live it. We, there are high probability short-term rewards that I think are almost certainly going to happen. It is going to transform the world. The thing I try to caution people on is to believe that we, um, uh, you know, those existential risks are very low probability and they're much longer off. And so it is more important for us to try to build a just, um, just world where the motivations, the incentives for doing those existential risks are, are as low as possible. So one of the things that I am always trying to remind people is uh, we have invented new communication technologies before, right? You know, when we invented the printing press, suddenly a bunch of people learned to read and, and people started publishing pamphlets on things like, how do you know if your neighbor's a witch? What should you do about that? You know, uh, and, and, and chaos ensued. Like we had wars that were, you know, killed huge numbers of people. When we invented the cheap printing press, we had wars about misinformation, things like, you know, yellow journalism. But we learned and we responded. You know, we, we developed journalistic ethics. We founded journalism schools to teach those things. Journalistic uh, trade associations to help people self-regulate. We passed laws on media concentration to make sure that you know you got to hear from different voices. We learned about how it lived in our media environment or our information environment and we responded. You know, the rise of radio, people had personal relationships with their leaders for the first time. You know, influenced people in really dramatic ways and led to things like the rise of dictators in World War II. But we learned, we responded, you know, we, we invested in public media. We doubled down on things like media concentration so people could get different kinds of information. It feels overwhelming right now because, because we're the ones who are responsible for figuring out how to, where we go from here. You know, it's about what, you know, how are, how are we going to learn? How are we going to respond? How are we going to act? And part of why I have faith that we're going to figure this out is, is while it may seem impossible right now, every single time before when we've made a new media technology, we've learned and we've responded. So I, 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 I will keep on pushing. And I just have a longer time horizon, I think, than, than many other people do. Thank you so much for talking with me. Your new book is called The Power of One, How I Found the Strength to Tell the Truth and Why I Blew the Whistle on Facebook. Thank you so much.